I am Professor Salim speaking from Lahore and assalamualaikum to everybody. Tom is about the bowel management and we have a, uh, a couple of cases related to this uh, which are uh, patients of anorectal malformation and Hirschsprung disease which needs a bowel management program. Uh, I request Professor uh, Dr. Naeem to introduce Ms. Jolie uh, who is the first speaker in this meeting. Dr. Naeem, continue with introduction. Sir, thank you. So, on the behalf of APSP, Association of Pediatric Surgeons of Pakistan, uh, I welcome you all. And uh, just a brief introduction about the Julie and uh, Catherine. So, Julie he, he is working uh, now at the Children's National uh, Colorectal Center at Children's National Hospital, Washington, D.C. And uh, she is the uh, she's working in the field of the program management and uh, as a past director of the poised her to develop a collaborative center in the national capital, treating and serving children from all over the United States and the world. And uh, she is uh, currently uh, working as uh, uh, she is currently running the bowel management program independently at uh, Children's National Hospital, along with the team of the Mark Levitt. And Catherine, Catherine is a certified pediatric nurse practitioner with a background in acute care, surgery, intensive care, trauma and burn. And uh, if she, as a mid-level provider, Katie would work with a team of surgeons caring for pediatric trauma, burns, and general surgery patients. And in 2017, she began independently running a bowel management program at National for surgical patients who struggle with constipation and incontinence following colorectal repair. Uh, so this is a very brief introduction of Catherine Wurst and uh, Julie Kyoki. So Julie, can you please start the presentation? Yes. Salaamu Alaikum. We're happy to be with you all this evening and thank you for welcoming us. We are excited to talk to you about what it means to have a bowel management program in your hospital and for your patients. I think the first thing we want to talk about is just how important this care is to the patient. So when you think about giving your patients a good surgical outcome, we know that we have to think not only about the time spent in the operating room, but we also need to recognize, um, Mark, Mark Levitt, our partner, recognizes that for every four to eight hours a, group may, a patient may spend in the operating room, they're gonna need a lot of time afterwards, up to maybe 96 hours of nursing care in the immediate future to help take care of their bowel management. So we wanna make sure we share with you what's needed to help your surgical patients stay healthy and have a successful outcome. And one thing I wanna mention, you just heard me refer to Dr. Levitt as Mark. At our center here, we refer to each other in the first name, by our first name. We believe that speaking this way to each other and being familiar with each other in this way creates an environment where all of our voices are heard equally and are considered equally important in the care of our patients. And we know that research and literature supports that having that type of environment creates a safer patient care environment. So when you hear us refer to Mark, we are speaking about Dr. Levitt. So bowel management, um, what does that mean? Well, for us, it means um, think of it as a way to keep our patients clean and to control the colon so that our families can be clean and be continent. And we'll, we'll either say continent or we'll say clean. Our families think of it as being clean. And the populations that we're taking care of and keeping clean um, consist of four main types. We have patients who suffer from anal rectal malformations, patients with Hirschsprung's disease, <coughs> Not sure who's coughing, if they could perhaps mute, that would be great. Um, patients with anal rectal malformations, patients with Hirschsprung's disease, patients with functional constipation or spinal abnormalities or isolated um, sacral anomalies. It's important to note there that we use the term functional constipation and not idiopathic constipation. Because we know that in these patients, the colon is functioning, it's just moving very slowly. So the first thing we need to think about when we're trying to keep these patients clean is what is the potential 
what what do we expect? What do we anticipate? Do we think it's going to be easy? Do we think it's going to be difficult? Is it something that we can even hope to achieve, no matter how great the surgery is? What do we think? So there's some things we look at, and we're going to talk about those things, things like anatomical evaluation, um, things about whether or not the patient's at the right age for potty training, and then whether or not the family's goals and our goals are the same. So we'll talk a little bit about each one of those. The first thing that you're going to look at um, in predictors of bowel control is the type of anal rectal malformation. We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the anal rectal malformation type. We're going to look at the quality of the sacrum and the quality of the spine. And these are for our patients with anal rectal malformations. And you can see we've listed the different types of fistulas there, perineal, vestibular, bulba, cloaca, where you see it's less than three centimeters. That is the referring to the length of the common channel. So is the common channel in the cloacal patient less than three centimeters or is it greater than three centimeters? Some of these types of malformations have a poor prognosis for bowel control and some have a much better prognosis for bowel control. But it's important that we are realistic with our families it's not good, or we don't say it's not possible, your child can't be, you know, can't have bowel control, or it's gonna be easy, your child's gonna have a great, it's no problems. But we do say some children are gonna be harder to achieve bowel control, and some children might have an easier pathway. So we wanna be realistic with the families so they don't think it's gonna be very easy if we know it's going to be very difficult. Um, and again, we're looking at the that type of, of malformation and we look at it as a continuum. So it's not one space on the graph, it's kind of a continuum of care and they're gonna move through that continuum. The next predictor of bowel control that we look at is the quality of the patient's sacrum. And this is something that you can work with your radiologist if you're not familiar, but when you're looking at these x-rays, um, we wanna calculate a sacral ratio. And here is how we do that sacral ratio calculation. We're looking at the area between the sacral iliac joint and the tip of the sacrum and taking that number, that measurement, and dividing it by the measurement of the iliac crest and the sacral iliac joint. And when we get that number, we can kind of rank whether or not it's going to be easy or difficult or poor or good. And you can see that a patient with a sacral ratio of 0.7 or greater has a much better chance of having bowel control than a patient with a low sacral ratio of 0.4 or under. One thing to note when you're working with your radiologist and you're calculating, when you're calculating your sacral ratios is that you wanna be looking at a lateral view of the X-ray. Um, that's going to eliminate confusion that you will get if you look at the anterior posterior view, the AP view. That shows a tilt and it makes it harder to calculate. So we look at the, um, at the lateral view for our sacral ratio when we calculate it. And again, it's nice to work with your radiologist and have them um, work with you to provide that so you don't have to calculate it on your own, but you can. The next thing we're looking at, we talked about the type of anal rectal malformation that the patient has, the quality of the sacrum. And the third indicator that we look at is the quality of the spine. And what are we looking at when we talk about the quality of the spine? Well, we want to see a normal, a normal, excuse me, a normal termination of the conus with a normal spine ending between L1 and L2, as well as a normal phylum appearance. So on the right, you see someone who has a tethered cord with a low-lying conus terminating, it looks like at about L4, L5, and a fatty phylum present as opposed to the one on the left, which um, terminates where it should at L1, L2. We don't see that fatty phylum um, and it's a nice low lying conus. So those are the things that we consider when we look at the spine. And then when we put all these three things together, we call it a report card. And every parent with a child, no matter where you live in the world, is used to seeing some type of a report card from the school telling them if it's the child's doing well or the child's not doing well. We put together a report card and we give it to our parents and we, we check off the boxes. What type of ARM 
anal rectal malformations they had. Are they going to get one points, two points, or three points, depending on it? You see that child, the cloacal malformation with the long common channel is only is going to get three points. And we add up the points and we talk about the spine and we talk about the sacrum. And then we give them the total points and whether or not we think the pathway for continence is going to be easy or good and whether or not the pathway for continence is going to be very difficult or very challenging. We try to be realistic and still give them some hope that we can work with them and help their child become clean. But it's important to give the parents that information. They actually um, like looking at that and it makes them feel more confident in the knowledge they have about their own child. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna take over from here for a little bit. So this was just a question to kind of bring that point home and so that we can look at an example. But if a patient came into your office and had a history of a rectobulbar fistula, also had a conus that terminated at L1 on his spinal MRI, and then we calculated his sacral ratio to be 0.54, uh, we then want to be able to predict this child's potential for confidence in the future and get that information for the family. For this patient um, in particular, we would say that he probably has a good potential for continence because using that scorecard or report card that we have, we would rate a rectobulbar fistula as low and he would get a score of one for that. And then his spine would also get him a score of one because it's a fairly good, um, he's got a good spine. And then his sacral ratio gives him a, a two um, because it's between 0.4 and 0.7. So we would tell the family that they have a good potential for continence. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he'll be continent tomorrow, but that we should be able to obtain that as a goal for him. Okay, and then Julie, I don't know that I can switch slides. So um, this is just an acronym that we have to help um, remember our anorectal malformation types, sacrum and spine, the three things that we look at in order to predict continence for a patient. Um, it forms the word ass, which refers to a donkey here in the United States. So the next group of patients that we look at are our Hirschsprung's patients. Now to predict their um, continence potential, we look at three things for them, and that includes the dentate line. We want to know whether or not it's damaged and intact or intact. Um, we do know that we can achieve continence in some patients with a slightly damaged dentate line, but we also know that, that by dissecting 0.5 to 1 centimeters above the dentate line, you can help protect it and leave that sensation intact for these patients. We also want to look at their sphincters and whether or not those are intact and working well. And then lastly, their colonic motility. Um, we often do uh, colonic studies in these patients to see how well their colon is moving throughout. Um, Okay, and then the last group is our functional constipation group. Um, these patients are typically set up for good potential for continence because they often have a normal anatomy. Um, that means that they have intact sphincters, their tentate line is also intact, and they have a good anal canal. But they do also have um, other factors that we need to look at, and that can include their colonic dilation, which if they have severe dilation of their colon from chronic constipation that's going to set them up for a more difficult time achieving continence. And then their colonic motility. Again, we can study this with both a colonic manometry test as well as an anorectal manometry test to show if they're able to withhold stool. And then any behavioral components that they have that may be making their stooling pattern more challenging for them, including withholding patterns. Um, some predictors of bowel control for our last group, the spinal anomalies group. Um, we want to look at for their nerve innervation as well as whether or not they have underdeveloped sphincters. This group is going to include like our spina bifida patients or anyone with a myelomeningocele, but it can also include anyone who has had an injury or trauma to their spine or tumors in or around their spine that may um, affect their bowel control.
So we've told you a bit about each of the populations, the Hirschsprungs, the functional constipation, the you know, rectal malformations, and the spinal patients, but all of them share one thing in common. If we want to get them clean and continent, socially continent, we need them to go through some type of formal program. And again, this is a time-consuming program that as a surgeon, you probably are not going to have the dedicated time to take care of these children through their bowel management care. So it's important to engage and train um, nurses to support you and work with you on this program. I know you, you likely don't have mid-level providers like Katie, a nurse practitioner, but even your registered nurses can be trained to help with your bowel management program. So- How many they can? We bring them in for one week um, and we, we kind of nickname it a boot camp. And if you're familiar at all with the US military, uh, military training, the first six to eight weeks, they call it boot camp. And it's very rigorous and very hard and very difficult. And it's kind of a, you know, it's a tough time for someone who's joining the military. That boot camp period is very rough. So we kind of, we, we like to call our program a boot camp because it is difficult. The parents and the child need to be engaged and know that it's going to be tough. It's going to be a lot of work that week, um, but the rewards are very great. We have patients who come into our bowel management program with their head held down. They don't want to look at anyone. They're embarrassed because they're soiling and they spend the time working with our nurse practitioners and our nurses. And one week later, they're walking out of the office with their head held high. They're smiling. They have new confidence because they're clean. So um, we're very realistic with the family and how difficult this week can be, but how much the reward, how great the rewards are. So there's some key items we need when we're putting our patients through the bowel management program. And the first thing we need is some testing. We need to be able to evaluate um, our colon and the rectum. And we do this most frequently with a contrast enema. So, um, you know, that'll, that'll give us a lot. We'll be able to see if they've had a, if it's a Hirschsprung's patient perhaps, and they've had a previous pull through and it was a suave, we might be able to see if there's a cuff present that we wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. Or maybe it was a, a Duhamel surgery and they have a pouch now that's causing problems. So that contrast enema shows us a lot. Um, but then we also need to be able to see under anesthesia the patient and examine them that way. And we try and do this under, an, under anesthesia as much as possible if the child is what we call anally defensive. And honestly, most patients are. It's difficult to hold a child down and do a rectal exam. And we don't wanna cause trauma to that child to make them upset and make them scared so that when we decide we need to do an enema, they're terrified to have anyone go near them. So we will often do this exam under anesthesia instead of trying to obtain it in the office. And then the next thing we start out with is daily x-rays. And over the six day period of this boot camp or this bowel management program, we'll be getting daily x-rays. And the x-rays are important for us to be able to assess the stool burden and see what the load is in the colon. So we can see whether or not we're evacuating them and keeping them keeping the colon clean as we intended. We'll definitely see the patient during that week. Usually we'll have three in-person visits in the, in the clinic, but in between the days when they don't come to us, the parents are keeping track of what's going on and recording it in a binder that we give them, a large uh, manual, and they'll keep track of it and they'll email our team daily and communicate with our team how things are going. And that's really important because you can tell your families one thing, but what they turn around and do when they leave your office can be very different. So we need that daily communication with the families to hear if they're doing what we ask them to do and how that's going. We also recommend providing your families with as much education as you can. This can be a video. It can be that they watch before they come to bowel management. It can be a lecture, a group session. Once they come to you, you can bring them all together and your nurses can do an educational session. But some type of education needs to be provided so that they understand the importance of the things you're going to ask them to do. You can't ask them to do something and expect them to do it if they, if they don't understand why. They need to have a lot of education. They should be your partners in caring for their child and that way you'll get best outcomes. 
And then the last thing we strongly recommend is some type of psychosocial support. What do I mean by that? Well, we interview our families or ask them after bowel management, how did it go and what, what, you know, what was good for them? What did they like about it? Most often we will hear that they liked being able to meet other families who are battling the same thing, who have the same challenges. And just that support of another family can really make a big difference. We also supply help with psychology, having a psychologist talk with the family, or if you have social workers, people who help with logistics of school when the child goes back to school and he needs to be able to keep clean clothes at school in case he has an accident or go to the restroom frequently, who's helping that family with the school? We provide someone in our group that can reach out to the school and talk with the school about what the child needs. So those kind of psychosocial supports are very important. Everything's challenged now by COVID and we're doing a lot more remote and over Zoom meetings, but we can still provide that family support that they need in order to be successful. So they come to you, you've given them support, they're ready for bowel management. How do you decide what to do? Should they just be given medication? Do they need an enema? Do they need a Malone? What's the right course of action for your family? There's several things to consider. Um, we've talked about the diagnoses, Hirschsprung's ARM, and the ways we assess for potential for bowel control with those diagnoses. Now we want to also consider their anatomy. So we talked about getting the CE. Do they have a giant dilated colon that you're going to have to overcome? Um, do they need a redo operation? Like I said, was there a stricture? Was there a cuff? Was there a pouch? Was there a twist? Was there a roof, a remnant of the original fistula? What kinds of things are popping up on their anatomy that you need to take into consideration? And then developmentally, is it a patient with autism that has a very difficult time even being touched? Is, are the patients going to be able to tolerate being catheterized through a Malone channel? Maybe you leave a device in place. We have a device that we can leave in our Malone appendicostomies so that the family doesn't have to catheterize the channel. They can just put hook the flush up to the device right into the appendix, right into the Malone. Um, so those kind of developmental considerations are very important. And then finally, your family adherence. And what do we mean by family adherence? Is the family going to do what you ask them to do? Because if they sit in your office and they listen to the wise surgeon talking and they just nod their head and walk out of the office, are they really going to do what you ask them to do? They're probably going to need some support. They're going to need a nurse on the phone to talk them through how to give that enema or a video to teach them how to do it or to catheterize the channel. Some patients are going to want things that surprise you. So you want to make sure you listen to their goals. We might think that a 14-year-old boy would want to take oral laxatives and find that taking oral medication is much nicer than having an enema. But then you talk to that 14-year-old boy and you find out that he doesn't like laxatives because he can't always predict the timing of when they're going to kick in and he's going to need to use the restroom. And that scares him. And he would rather have to do an enema at seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night and know that he's then going to have 24 hours of not having to worry about an accident at all. So you might be surprised. They might not choose what you choose, So make sure you're talking with them and understanding what their needs are. So the first one is the mechanical program. And we're going to talk about what that means, mechanical. Well, the mechanical program program is going to um, involve using enemas or flushes. And we call them enemas when we're doing them through the rectum, a rectal, en a rectal enema. And if we're going through a Malone or a Secostomy, an antegrade option, we'll call that a flush. But either way, our goal is the same. We want our children to wear these beautiful Superman underwear and feel very strong and very powerful because they're clean. I cannot imagine what it would be like to sit and worry about whether or not I'm going to have a bowel movement when I'm sitting with my friends or talking with my colleagues or playing a sport or jumping rope outside with my friends or playing basketball. But that's what these children live with. So all the things that we're doing are to help them be 
be able to wear underwear like all the other children and live life like all the other children and achieve that social continence. So our enema and flushes, um, some very important things to keep in mind with these is the technique. We want to make sure that we are teaching parents these techniques so that we get a good outcome. The first thing we want to teach them is to give it at the same time every day. We can't expect the same components of the enema or the flush to work the same if the bowel is filled with stool or there's just some stool in the descending colon. So we want to make sure we're giving it at the same time every day so that we're adjusting the components of the flush to meet the demands of the colon. The next thing we do is with our Antigrade or our Malone options, um, we use a Coudet catheter to catheterize those. If you've seen a Coudet catheter, the very end of it is tipped and that is, makes for easy insertion for the family. So we recommend those. If we're using a rectal enema, we use a 24 French Foley catheter. And the reason why we do this is it has a nice big balloon that can be, um, you can blow up the balloon 30 mLs, I think all the way up to 90. But what that does is create a super tight seal in the rectum to allow the solution to stay up in the rectum and produce a good, um, a good response with the stool that's there. We'll have them sit with that, that solution for five to 10 minutes on those rectal enemas before they release the solution and sit on the toilet and have that time where they sit and evacuate their colon. So what's inside our enema? We start with a base solution of saline um, and you have this PowerPoint, it's got our starting doses on it and our maximum doses and how we titrate it up. But we always wanna have a base solution and then add a stimulant. Now I have saline in the slide for a base solution. We use that to, so that we don't cause hyponatremia in patients. However, we are looking at using water more often for children over the age of three or around three or around 10 kilos or greater. We might be able to use water for those children, which is easier for families because they don't have to make salt water or they don't have to buy it. But for the littler ones, we're definitely using saline. And then, as I said, we're going to add a stimulant um, to the base solution. We typically start out with glycerin and find that that's very um, efficient in stimulating the bowels. And how does it stimulate? It irritates the lining of the bowel wall. So we want to irritate the lining of the bowel wall, kind of agitate it to get things moving. Sometimes the glycerin can cause cramping or we max out. We've given all the glycerin we can give and it's still not working. We might add in then Castile soap or any baby shampoo, a gentle baby shampoo. Um, sometimes the baby shampoo, the patients like better and say it doesn't cause cramping as much. So if they're having trouble with the glycerin, we might use that. And then recently, um, within the last few years, we started using bisicodal, and that was something that came to us from our partners in the GI motility world. They were using it for kids that needed to be cleaned out for their procedures and found it to be very effective. So sometimes if we've used our glycerin, maxed out, we've used baby shampoo and we're still not getting the response, we might move to bisicodal. I mention it because it's good to have partners we wouldn't have thought of it had we not spoken with our friends in GI when they were doing manometry and needed to clean kids out or other procedures. So it's nice to build partners within your hospital that can help you. Uh, radiology can help you with those sacral ratios. Pathology can help you when you're doing um, biopsies on your patients for Hirschsprungs. You need to have those partners and establish those relationships and it'll make your world easier. And it's better for the patients. Um, so then titrating the enemas, as I said, we see these patients every day for six days. The first thing we're going to check with our flush is, is it emptying the colon? So we want to get those x-rays every day. We want the x-rays to be at the same time every day. We want the flush to be at the same time every day so that every day we're looking at the same situation. If the x-ray shows that there's still stool in there, um, we know we need to increase the flush. Whether they're soiling or not, if we're not cleaning up the colon, we need to, to bump it up a bit. <clears throat> if the x-ray shows that the colon's clean, but the patient's telling you that they're soiling, 
we know that it's a little too much agitation and we want to decrease the strain. If the x-ray shows that it's clean and the patient's not having accidents, we know we hit the sweet spot. We're right where we want to be and things are going great. Um, patients need to be comfortable doing this. It's, it's hard, but um, and they are going to have some cramping. And we tell them that cramping is normal. And once they sit down on the toilet and evacuate the colon, the cramping should subside. But if the cramping, if they're complaining that it's so bad that they don't want to do their flush, there's some tips you can give them. They can slow down the rate at which they infuse it. Infuse it. They can warm up the solution so cold water is not hitting that colon. Um, they can use the baby soap instead of the glycerin, and we can try that. If they're vomiting and telling you they're really nauseous, um, we can do those things, but also advise them not to do this two hours before they eat or two hours after they eat. Um, that, that can really help out. And then if they have gas, again, we think about changing the stimulant from glycerin to Castile or bisacodyl, something that helps cut down on the gas. The point is they need to like what they're doing or they won't do it. So that's kind of the, the mechanical program in a nutshell. And now Katie's going to walk you through the medication program of the bowel management program. So we're going to talk about some of the medications that we use um, for these patients. Our, our goals when using medications, and Julie, are you still able to help me with a Perfect, thank you. Um, is still to achieve ideally one to two voluntary bowel movements a day. And we want them to effectively empty their colon every day on the medications. And the goals will be to not have any soiling and to achieve social continence and ultimately clean underwear. We want these patients to feel the same as their friends and to be able to do the same activities as their peers without any fear of having accidents throughout the day. Um, I would mention that for the most part, we will start laxative on our younger children. So patients under the age of two or three before they've reached the age of potty training. At that point, we're putting them on medicine really just to help prevent constipation. We wanna make sure that they're emptying their colon every day but it's not so important as to when they're having their bowel movements or that their bowel movements are on a toilet. We're just hoping to keep them free from constipation. And then oftentimes as kids will approach potty training age, they do often need to temporarily need to be put on laxative, I'm sorry, on enemas. The enemas often help the patients retrain their colon. And I explain this to families by telling them that their child has had some degree of constipation their entire life. So the normal signals that your colon sends to your brain to tell you that there's stool in your colon and you need to go to the bathroom, their bodies have either stopped sending those signals or learned to ignore them altogether. And so we need to give them a temporary respite of, of time away from having cool stool in their colon so that they can learn what it feels like to be clean. And then we will introduce laxatives usually six to 12 months later. Um, and then they're much able to, better able to recognize the difference between having a colon full of stool versus having an empty colon. And they're much more successful at potty training and making it to the bathroom in time on these medications that we're gonna put them on. So when we start laxative therapy in these patients, um, it's really important to start to know to get an abdominal x-ray to start. Um, the laxatives that we use are really great at preventing constipation, but they're not so great at treating constipation. So if your patient has an abdominal x-ray that's full of stool or has a large stool burden, and then we start to give them laxatives, a lot of times the laxatives aren't strong enough to push out a, a large accumulation of stool, and the patients oftentimes will get sick or throw up. Um, so we wanna get an x-ray first to make sure that they don't have an overabundance of stool, or any fecal impaction on their x-ray. And if we do, then we may need to do a clean out before we start the laxatives. Um, our clean outs are, we'll use Miralax or sometimes enemas from below to clean them out before we start the enemas. Um, yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> uh, so our stimulant laxative dose, our Initial dose when we find, get these patients is, to, is based on their history and the assessment of their diagnostic studies. So any abdominal x-rays and contrast enemas that they've had in the past. 
their, their contrast NMO may show that they have a very large dilated colon, and so they may need a little bit of a stronger dose. Or same if you get an abdominal x-ray and you see a very large abundance of stool, then we know that that patient is not clearing their stool as well as they should be, and they may need a larger dose. Um, we don't usually give laxative and large volume enemas at the same time. We do one program or the other. And again, this is just reiterating the importance of an x-ray, but if we see soiling in a patient or a patient comes to your office with a history of soiling, it's hard to tell just based on that symptom as to whether or not it's because they're constipated and they're having overflow incontinence as accidents, um, or if they're clean and um, they may be, we may have them on medicine and that's actually too strong. So it's, it's always good to get an x-ray to see what effect your medicine is having um, before we make an adjustments. And then having that conversation with families that while we're doing, we're placing their child on a laxative dose, it's all trial and error in the beginning. Um, while we can put a patient on a dose based on their size and their history, every patient responds to the medicine a little bit differently. So it's important to warn them ahead of time that this is gonna take a little bit of patience on their part for us to find the right dose for their child. The medication that we use is Senna. This is a natural herbal medication that contains senicides, which are derived from the leaves of a Senna plant. Um, the senicides are considered stimulants because they irritate the lining of the bowel and they cause a laxative or increased peristaltic peristalsis effect. We do not use Miralax in our practice as a maintenance medication because it's an osmotic laxative and it often softens the stool, but it doesn't stimulate a bowel movement. It also makes it very difficult for our patients with anorectal malformations to sense the need to use the bathroom because their stools become so loose um, that they can't feel any distension in the rectum or colon to, to make it obvious that, they need, that, that there is stool there and they need to go to the bathroom. So, We'll use um, Miralax or polyethylene glycol for cleanouts, but we don't typically use it as a maintenance medication. It's important to know that when you're starting these medications, we get a lot of questions from parents who are concerned about the possible long-term effects of being on Senna as a maintenance medication. Um, there are, there's a lot of literature to support that there isn't any long-term complications or contraindications to using Senna for a long periods of time. Um, but it's important to be able to have those conversations with families because they do have a lot of questions. We also um, have gotten raised the issue of Senna burns. Senna has been um, associated with burns to the buttocks on the skin, but in our literature review, we found that it's actually usually only in smaller, younger patients and with high doses of Senna when they have prolonged exposure of the stool with the, with the skin. Um, so as long as we're mindful of the dose that we're putting on patients and then making sure that we continually reinforce skin care and changing of the diapers, um, we've been able to avoid Senna burns in our patients. I also tell patients when I'm starting them on laxatives that it takes about 12 hours for Senna to take effect. So most of our patients will take Senna in the evening and then it usually results in a bowel movement first thing in the morning. So in the younger patients, it's just good for parents to know that. Um, but then as they approach the potty training age and we're trying to help them be successful in having their bowel movements on the toilet, uh, we wanna make sure that if they take their medication in the evening, they're sitting on the toilet first thing in the morning, even if they don't yet sense the need to go, just giving them that time to sit to hopefully result in a bowel movement, but then I also tell patients when they're first starting on laxatives to sit on the toilet every time after they eat a meal or a large snack, because every time you eat, it triggers peristalsis, and so it may result in a bowel movement, and those first few weeks while we're on a laxative trial, we're trying to discover the patient's pattern or response to the medicine, and eventually we should be able to recognize that this patient usually has a bowel movement first thing in the morning and after lunch or after lunch and after dinner. Um, but then in the beginning phase, when you're first putting a patient on laxatives and we're essentially helping them to potty train all over again, we just want to set them up for success. And so oftentimes I'll tell patients to sit on the toilet first thing in the morning and then after every meal and snack until we figure out that pattern for them.
So when we're starting our stimulant or laxative dose, um, our dosing is typically two milligrams per kilo when we're using the Senna. Um, and then we have, we don't necessarily have a max dose. It's more so based on the patient's tolerance. Um, patients we found like with a more dilated colon are going to need higher doses of Senna. And so as long as the patient is tolerating it and it's resulting in a bowel movement and they're not having unwanted side effects, and that would include um, cramping outside of having a bowel movement, it's okay to continue to go up on your Senna dose. I do warn patients that on Senna, they're going to experience some cramping because it's helping the colon to contract and move that, st that stool throughout the colon. But as long as the cramping resolves when they have a bowel movement or that the cramping happens only associated with having bowel movements, that's okay. We don't want them to be having cramping or abdominal discomfort between bowel movements because that would indicate to us that we're too high on the medication. Um, so common issues when we're on a laxative problem or laxative medication would be if they start to have loose stools. Because laxatives are moving the stool through the colon at a faster rate than it typically would move, your body isn't able to absorb as much water. And so the stools will consequently become more loose. And so we'll give them water soluble fiber. And I'll talk more about that in a moment um, to help bulk the stools and help them achieve that control of their bowel movements. But if they have loose stools, then we'll consider adding more fiber um, and possibly decreasing the dose of the Senna. And then alternatively, if they don't stool on the Senna, we may need to again clean them out because we don't want to increase their dose while they may be accumulating stool in there and potentially make them sick. So we'll usually give them either an enema or a small Miralax clean out depending on how many days it's been since they've stooled um, and then increase the dose of their daily medication. Some other products that we use um, are, is bisacodyl, and Julie touched on this a little bit in that we use it sometimes in our enemas, but we can also use it as a stimulant laxative um, if you're giving it orally. Uh, it also irritates the lining of the bowel and it causes a laxative or increased peristalsis effect. We usually use this as a second line treatment because it tends to provoke frequent smaller bowel movements in our patients as opposed to the Senna which usually produces fewer larger bowel movements per day. And most of our patients want fewer consolidated bowel movements. Um, so we'll usually use it as a second line of treatment if, uh, if our, we're not successful with the Senna. It does come in both pill form, um, but that can be crushed uh, if the patients have difficulty swallowing tablets. Some side effects with the bisacodyl is also some cramping or nausea. So, um, Again, we want to warn patients about these symptoms, but hopefully it's the, any cramping that they have resolves with a bowel movement, and then they shouldn't be having cramping between bowel movements. Um, these are the, a picture of the fleet enemas that we'll sometimes use when, giving, when we're giving Senna if we need to do a small clean out from below just before we're going up on the medication dose. So if a patient doesn't stool for 24 hours, we may give them a fleet enema from below um, if they've never been on enemas before, so they don't have the supplies for high volume enemas, we can just give a small fleet enema to kind of clean them out from below so that when we go to that higher dose of Senna, um, there's room for the Senna to push that stool through. So this slide talks about our water soluble fiber. Um, so I briefly mentioned before that when you're on Senna, the stools will often become more loose. And so we use water-soluble fiber to help bulk the stools. This can sometimes be the most difficult part of getting a patient to take medication because they're not all patients, particularly our younger ones, want to take fiber supplementation. Um, Nutrisource has become the fiber supplement of choice for most of our patients because it doesn't have a flavor, as opposed to Metamucil and Citrusel, which are often orange flavored or the ones that are available at the store, often orange flavored and the kids don't find them as uh, palatable. So Nutrisource doesn't have a flavor, but so most of our patients are taking that, but then also our younger patients appreciate the Metamucil wafers and crackers that are available and will sometimes take those. These agents do help uh, bulk the stool, but they work best if you take small amounts throughout the day. So 
we'll typically start on two milligrams twice a day and have a patient take a dose in the morning and the evening. And then as we go up on the dose, we'll even spread it out further throughout the day to help its um, efficacy. Um, and then we have found that pectin and Nutrisource have worked the best in our hypermodal patients. Um, and we'll talk more about that population in a second. So as I mentioned, we usually start on a dose of two grams twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And then we titrate this dose based on the frequency of their stools and the consistency and if we're able to get them thicker. There's not typically a maximum dose with the exception of Nutrisource, we cap out at six scoops. Um, but for the most part, somewhere between when patients are getting four to six grams a day, we'll also then start adding um, other supplementation or things to help bulk or slow down their colon if we need to, um, as I find that at a certain point, you're not making a lot of progress by just giving them more and more fiber. Um, and again, just our common ones are Citrusel, Metamucil, Pectin, and Nutrisource. So when we tell patients that we're gonna put them on fiber in order to help bulk their stools, most of our patients um, assume that their over-the-counter fibers that they've been used to taking is, is what we're talking about. And so we have to have that conversation with families that products like Benefiber or Fiber One Bars um, are usually the water-insoluble fibers and fibers that we wanna to try to avoid because they have more of a laxative effect than water-soluble fibers as the one, like the ones that we're recommending. So I also have conversations with families about um, fibers in foods and the fibers in, in Benefiber for whatnots have a different effect than, than water soluble fibers. And most families aren't aware that there are different types of fibers. So this is also an important conversation to have. So I just also wanna briefly touch base on our hypermotility program or protocol. Most patients, when we think of anorectal malformations or Hirschsprung's patients, we think of constipation and Certainly when we talk about bowel management, for the most part, we're talking about patients who have difficulty with constipation. But there are a subset, there's a group of patients within both populations that have hypermotility of their colon and actually will have incontinence and frequent stooling accidents because their colon moves too fast. So for these patients, we need to be able to slow them down. So we start with a constipating diet and offering that water-soluble fiber to help bulk their stools and make it um, more consolidated heart, easier for them to consolidate the number of stools that they're having each day. And then we slowly make our way down this protocol, um, adding different medications at the appropriate doses to try to slow down their colon. Generally in um, our practice, after adding lopiramide or hyoscyamine, which is Imodium or Levsin, we often then also consider a small nightly volume, or sorry, a small volume nightly enema to give to these patients. And so what we typically use in our large volume enemas, we, we try to basically cut it in half and we'll give those enemas to these patients if, they're, if we're not able to slow them down successfully with just these, those top three medications um, so that we can keep them clean at least for overnight. But in our experience, when we've placed patients on the small volume enemas in addition to these hypo hypermotility medications, we've been able to consolidate them to still hopefully one or two bowel movements a day, um, which is much more manageable for the families. But we consider the small volume enemas at that point after low pyramide and hyoscyamine um, in, a, in an attempt to avoid further medications and possible side effects for these patients. So most of our patients are, were able to avoid going further down on the protocol at that point. Um, And then also still very important to have with all of our families is just diet modifications. And you know, most patients want to know how their diet is impacting their, their bowel, bowel pattern. And many families aren't even aware that, that it is contributing to their stooling pattern. So it's good to have these conversations with all of our patients. But we talk to them about laxative foods. And these are foods that are going to make stool move faster throughout the colon. And we talked to them about sugars, uh, foods that are high in sugar, which can be sweets, but also can be fruit. Um, berries are a big culprit. 
um, that will actually lead to more accidents. Um, other foods that will do this will be high, like fat or greasy foods um, or fried foods will also make patients go to the bathroom more, more often. So we encourage laxative foods, such as a lot of fruits or, or raw vegetables in our patients who have constipation, but then we also need to make sure that our patients who have hypermotility are avoiding those foods. Same with our constipating or foods that lead to constipation. We want to make sure that families are aware of foods that have or cause constipation, such as bananas and rice, pasta, breads. Again, we want these are the foods that we encourage our patients who have hypermotility to eat more of, while the same patients who have const or sorry, hypomotility, we want them to avoid a diet high in those foods. So it's important for all of our families to at least be aware of those differences so that they can associate a lapse in a bowel management program to that it could be. No need to buy So sometimes families will call you because the program or the regimen that they've been on for weeks or months all of a sudden isn't working. And then when you start to ask her, ask them questions or inquire about any dietary changes that they've made, you'll find that they started introducing smoothies as breakfast last week. And that could very well be what's causing their accidents, not any um, problem with their actual regimen. Whoops. Okay, we had some case studies to present. Um, we did give you the PowerPoint. You have this. Um, and Naeem can send it out to everyone who's on the call, and you can look through these case studies. I think in the interest of time, we're right at, um, right at about time. I want to make sure we have time to answer some questions. So I'll let you look at those case studies on your own, but we do have a Hirschsprung's disease patient for you, an anal rectal malformation case study for you, and a constipation uh functional constipation case study to look at. Um, in follow-up, just there's some resources that are out there for you. The PowerPoint is great. You're going to have this with you, but we have some publications um, that Mark has published in conjunction with some of our nursing team members, and one of them is on fecal incontinence and constipation in children and talks about a lot of case studies that you might find very helpful. There's a link here um, for you for those publications, but they're easily found as well on, you know, Amazon, which has everything in life. We all discovered during COVID that all we needed was Amazon. Um, further resources, we also would encourage you to be directed towards the Pediatric Colorectal and Pelvic Learning Consortium, PCPLC as we call it, and it's easy to find on the web as well and has a lot of resources for you. We wanna acknowledge our whole team here at Children's National that supports us in taking care of these kids every day, our surgeons, our nurses, um, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. So um, it, it takes a village, it takes a team and non-clinical staff as well and we thank them all. So now Naeem, if you wanna um, work us, take us through some questions, I know that um, Dr. Levitt is with us as well. So we can take a look at some questions. How would you like to do that? Yes, there are a few questions and uh, two patients have been shared with me. And the uh, first question is by Professor Sharif. Have you done any randomized control trial between different days? I heard randomized control trials, but I didn't hear after that. Between different laxatives. Uh, between different laxatives. Uh, between the different senicides. Different stimulatives. Mm -hmm. I do not. Uh, I, I, we haven't done a, we have not done a randomized control trial. We have done a nice review of the safety of Senna. Um, and found that there was no problems with it. There is a paper, an important paper from Mexico City comparing uh, Miralax and Senna for ARM patients, which found Senna is much more effective. We can try to get you that reference. Um, basically, from a functional point of view, what Miralax does is it makes the stool, and I know this was mentioned, but I'm just repeating for emphasis. What Miralax does is it makes the stool soft 
it doesn't help it come out. And when a stool is soft, you lose the stretch of the rectum. And I think the stretch of the rectum is probably the most important factor of whether an ARM patient can feel stool and have control. Senna, on the other hand, pushes out the stool and to compensate for that push, which would normally make the stool very liquid, we give, as was mentioned, water-soluble fiber to provide a little bit of bulk and therefore the stool that gets pushed out by the senna is a single well-formed section of stool. And the, the patient can feel that much more. So we are big fans of stimulant laxatives. Senna and bisicodal are the only two types. And we do not like stool softeners. Miralax is the most common one. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, there is a case which has been shared by Dr. Asif, and let me share it on my own screen. Um, Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a five-year-old female uh, <clears throat> presented with fecal incontinence and her initial diagnosis was enorectal malformation, bucket handle anus, and uh, along with the Hirschsprung disease. Uh, her anoplasty had been done on second day of life and uh, ultrasound was normal. She had on and off constipation, and uh, then she underwent rectal biopsy, which was negative for ganglion cells. And uh, then she underwent sigmoid loop colostomy due to repeated enterocolitis, and uh, colostomy was positive for the ganglion cells. So she underwent Duhamel pull through. Uh, presented in the OPD clinic with complaint of fetal incontinence since the surgery, uh, and or truncated cord with conus at L1, uh, poorly, poorly developed posterior osseous element at level of distal sacrum and coccyx with spina bifida at this level. And uh, EUA showed normal sphincter contractions all around, adjusted 17 size Thacker dilator, no spur, normal dented, normal osmotic pull through. And uh, then underwent the are the films of the barium enema. It's a stricture. And, uh, this, these are the films. Uh, uh, probably during the ball management program. So they are having some difficulty. Dr. Asif, can you please unmute and uh, share your question? And uh, she has written that if there is contrast retention on 24 hour fail, will we consider that hypomotile colon? Uh, I, is that for me, I guess? The, the, the colon in Duhamel usually is hypomodal. Um, I think it, was, it looks like a good operation. It does not look like a big Duhamel pouch. It does not look like there's a spur. I am a little bit concerned of one area that seems to remain narrow um, on the contrast study. And I, I wonder, was this a preceding colostomy? I maybe missed that in the details. Um, was that um, a, then a subsequent pull through? It does widen a little bit, but it remains somewhat fixed in the hepatic flexure. I'd be concerned that there's a stricture there. And I would love to see another lateral image to be absolutely certain there's no Duhamel spur. Let's 
So the next question is that in index, in index case, there was contrast retention, but it acted as hypermotile colon, and there were accidents in spite of excess being clear. On treated is that hypermotile colon with maximum dose of lopramide and simple saline. Uh, there was some improvement, but she still, but still there were accidents despite excess being clear. Was she also being treated with a constipating diet or any fiber or just the lopiramide? Not sure. Dr. Asif, can you please join me? Yes, Dr. Naeem, he is on strict uh, uh, meals and on fibers, uh, fibers on uh, BD. Uh, we we are using the dextrin uh, in uh, BD dose five milligram. Each sachet contains two point five grams. Uh, each sachet contains two point five grams. And how large was the the saline enema that the patient was getting? Currently, we are using. Uh, a uh, low dose enema, 200 ml normal saline. Uh, at starting, it was high dose enema, about 350 ml of normal saline. Okay. Uh, so I might continue with the hypermotility like medications, including the constipating diet and fiber, and then she may even need like hyoscyamine um, to further slow her down between enemas. There are a handful of patients that I've even done twice a day low volume enemas on um, when, they're, when they're significantly hypermodal to help keep them clean. Hey, Dr. Asif, do you have any other question? Okay, no, Dr. Naim, thank you. Okay, this is, uh, okay, thank you. So this is a case shared by Dr. Lareb. Uh, she's uh, currently working at Travelpindi Medical University. Dr. Lareb, can you please uh, tell us the history and the details? Uh, yes, sir. We have a patient six year old male who came to us with complaints of constipation. Uh, since two years of age. Uh, he only passes stool by giving spostries and enemas. There was no history of uh, delayed passage of meconium. His examination was done. On DRE, anus was normally placed. The tone was normal, but there were hard impacted stools. His X-ray lumbosacral spine was normal. Barium enema done, which shows dilated rectum and colon. Uh, we gave him enema. Uh, 200 ml normal saline with 20 ml glycerine before starting oral executive trial. We started oral executive trial by giving two tablets of Dulcolex daily, uh, but he didn't respond on uh, tablet Dulcolex. Now, currently, he's taking five tablets of Dulcolex with fiber added, but still he passes little amount of stool with severe pain abdomen. Katie, you want to go I didn't know you want me to, uh, are we evaluating such a patient? You want to start with an, an exam under anesthesia and any manometry studies? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not sure what you guys have as the availability for anesthesial manometry, but I think that's a very important study here. Uh, I doubt it's Hirschsprung's, but it would be important to know if there was a rare um, present or absent. And what our routine has been, which I think has worked out very well, is to do an interrectal manometry looking for a rare under the same procedure. If there is no rare, meaning no relaxation of the internal sphincter, then we need to biopsy for Hirschsprung's 
and we treat with Botox for the possibility that this is internal sphincter achalasia. And of course, if the biopsy comes back Hirschsprung's, very, very unlikely, then of course we know what to do. If the biopsy comes back no Hirschsprung's, the Botox might have been the solution. And then this is a patient who should respond to laxatives. However, if laxatives are difficult for them to take or they can't successfully empty, this is a very good patient for an, either rectal enemas, many times they won't tolerate those, sometimes they do, or antigrade enemas with a Malone flush. And most of these re patients respond very well with an antigrade flush. So that's how we would uh, work up such a patient. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, Mark, so if we are using Dulcolex, can we divide it in like, uh, if we are using two tablets, so patient is not passing stool, should we switch to three tablets or can we choose the two and a half or something like that? They try, Senna. So Katie, how would you, or Julie, how would you modulate your laxative dosing? This is something that comes up a lot. People don't know how much laxative to choose. They don't know how to go up. They're afraid of the dose. How do you decide that? So we usually go up when we're using Senna by one unit or one tab. Um, or five mLs, which is how it's concentrated here, um, when we're needing to go up. And then when we need to go down, we usually come down by half a unit or half a tab, um, trying to, because we know that we anticipate that the patients are going to need more rather than less. Um, we don't have a maximum dose. Uh, it's really titrated to the effect. So we want to, we'll keep going up until the patient does respond and have bowel movements. And if we're able to achieve a dose that the patient is having bowel movements and not having side effects of the, of the medication, meaning between bowel movements, they continue to be comfortable and eat well and sleep well, um, then, then we've been successful in identifying a dose. But if we get to the point that in order for the medication to be successful in having a bowel movement, that they're, in order to get to, the, or to, when we get to that dose, they're also having the side effects, then we then we know that we need to switch to either a different regimen or possibly a mechanical option, but at least for a temporary period of time, um, such as that, that last patient that you showed, even if they may benefit from an integrade enema or rectal enemas, just until we can get the colon to that distension to come down, and at which time we could try laxatives again, that they may do better and require a smaller dose in the future. So how do you switch in between the dull collects? Like we don't get Sina here very frequently. You don't get any Sina there frequently? No. I have to go back to the... So you need to, um, obviously, uh, bisacodal is a good uh, proactive um, stimulant laxative. We use Senna, we feel comfortable with Senna. Bisacodal works well too. Try, I would try to use Senna. It's a plant-based, it's extremely safe. There's a very nice review article of several hundred patients that show its safety. So, and you can order it on Amazon. Um, I would, it's not a prescription in the United States. I would try to uh, get familiarity with that because it's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice, um, drug, uh, medication, um, and uh, then dosing, as Katie um, and Julie have discussed, is key, and don't be afraid. You can go up on the dose, whatever you need, and if you need to go high and the patient can't tolerate that, then that's a patient who may need a mechanical program. You're not, you're not able to get Senna at all? Um, it is not like uh, you get there in the form of the x lax or calculated doses. It is there, but like uh, it is not that much uh, uh, calibrated. So if there are no more questions, I am uh, really thankful to the Mark Levitt, Julie, and Catherine. And uh, on the behalf of APSP, uh, I want to thank you all of uh, thanks to uh, say thanks to all of you. 
and uh, have a good day and hope we can see you uh, in very near future in another meeting and uh, with a lot of more questions so to the participants if you have any case any difficulty you can directly send an email to all of them as they have shared a lot of things